Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the to the last webinar of Cornerstone Barristers Public Law Week 2023. It's uh, it's great to see so many of Chambers' regular clients online this morning, and indeed some a good number of uh, of new names and faces. So thank you all for joining us. For those of you who've logged on earlier in the week for previous webinars, um, and indeed for those of you who haven't, you should be uh, you should know that those webinars uh, recordings of them are available online to to view separately. So please do make use of that facility. And uh, Joe and I very much hope that you enjoy this last webinar in the series. So today, Joe Cannon and I are going to be talking to you about the principles and practice of public authority consultations and reconsultations. Um, as many of you will know, a duty to consult often arises, whether under statute or common law, when a public authority proposes a change in the law or changes in strategy, policy or practice. And fulfillment of that duty is often a precondition to bringing the change lawfully into effect. A failure to consult or to do so properly is therefore a ground on which the, the lawfulness of the change may be challenged before the administrative court. So an understanding of the law and fundamental principles of consultation and reconsultation is critical for all public authorities and indeed all those exercising public functions. Getting it right, in short, is a necessity and getting it wrong uh, can be, as some of you may know, a costly error in terms of both money and time. So with that in mind, Joe and I will be taking you through some of the fundamentals of the law of consultation and reconsultation, starting with general principles of consultation. When will a duty to consult arise, which I will cover? And uh, when it arises, what will it require of a public authority, uh, which uh, Joe will cover? And we'll then look at consultation duties in specific contexts, planning on which Joe will spend some time, and licensing under the 2004 Housing Act, which I will cover briefly. Uh, and then finally, and forgive me I've, because I've uh, not switched the introduction slide, finally we'll cover some of the, the fundamentals of reconsultation. Uh, when might it be necessary to, to reconsult about a proposal on which an authority has already consulted? And uh, time permitting, we'll take a few questions at the end. So that's the broad structure of today's webinar. And so without further ado, let's look at some of the fundamental principles of consultation. When does a duty to consult arise? Well, it often comes as a surprise to clients to learn that the common law doesn't generally impose a duty uh, on public bodies to consult before making a decision or indeed before exercising another public function. And yet there is no general duty to consult at common law. Nor will the common law impose a duty based on gener a generalised assessment of what might be considered fairness. Uh, though, as we'll see, fairness has a limited role to play in determining whether a duty to consult will arise at common law. It cannot, in the, the words of Lord Justice Newey, act as a freestanding touchstone for when consultation on a proposal will be necessary. So in short, the circumstances in which common law will impose a duty to consult are limited. And as a result, in many cases, the duty will be imposed by statute instead. Why is that so? Uh, well, as Mr. Justice Haddon Cave once said, the, the government of the country would grind to a halt if every decision maker were required in every case to consult everyone who might be affected by every decision. And the law reports, uh, as many of you will know, are replete with judicial reminders that, uh, that the common law should be slow to impose a duty when a democratically elected body such as parliament has decided uh, not to impose one. So for these reasons and others, the common law will generally be slow to impose a duty. And uh, in many cases, a duty to consult will be imposed by statute instead. So having established that statute will sometimes impose the duty and the common law will be slow to do so, exactly what are the circumstances in which a duty to consult will generally arise? So there are broadly 
four circumstances in which a duty to consult will arise. First, as I've already mentioned, where it's imposed by statute. And so under parts two and three of the Housing Act 2004, for example, local housing authorities are obliged to take reasonable steps to consult those likely to be affected by uh, a proposed additional law selective licensing designation. And uh, as Joe will be able to tell you better than, better than me, uh, under the Town and Country Planning, Local Planning England Regulations 2012, local planning authorities are obliged to consult various bodies and persons before preparing a local plan. These are, of course, but two of myriad circumstances in which statute imposes the duty and indeed sets its specific particular parameters. Secondly, so the second of the four circumstances in which a duty uh, will arise, common law will impose a duty where a public body has promised to consult. The promise must be a clear promise, and so for the avoidance of doubt, certainly uh, more than the pictured pinky promise. Um, rarely will a duty arise where there's been no promise or assurance, either of consultation itself or, or the continuance of a policy or practice to consult. But having said that, where a public authority does promise to consult before making a decision or before taking a particular step, then principles of good administration will generally require that it does so, unless that is, uh, consultation would conflict with the authority's statutory duties. Uh, and uh, the authority for that <coughs> is the uh, Attorney General case at the bottom of, of your slide. And as the, the courts held in Nadaraja and Davis, um, an express representation that there will be a consultation may indeed create a legitimate and enforceable expectation of consultation, as indeed might an established practice of consulting, at least where that practice is sufficiently clear and unequivocal. So having an established practice of doing so is therefore the third circumstance in which a duty to consult may be imposed uh, at law. As an aside, I should add that the circumstances in which claims alleging the breach of a legitimate expectation succeed tend to be rare, at least they are difficult claims. Um, even where a legitimate expectation is created, it must further be shown generally that there would be unfairness amounting to uh, essentially an abuse of power for the public authority not to be held to its promise or practice. Uh, and so, uh, so held Lord Wolfe in the Coffin case back in 2001, and I would suggest many, many public authorities have, at least the law reports would suggest, found some salvation in that particular decision since. And then fourthly, again at common law, a duty will arise where on the facts of a given case, a failure to consult would cause conspicuous unfairness. Uh, and I would stress that the unfairness that it would cause has to be conspicuous the fact that it has to be conspicuous has the effect of setting the bar for imposing a duty in these particular circumstances very high. Um, before I hand over to Joe momentarily, I should, should add that outside of these four circumstances, where a public authority has taken it upon itself to engage in consultation, the courts will generally hold the, the authority to the requirements of lawful consultation, even if on the facts, a duty to consult would not have been imposed at common law. And uh, the recent case of Binder and Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, Pensions is an example. It's a 2022 decision, presently before the Court of Appeal, in which Mr Justice Griffiths held that although a duty would not otherwise have arisen at common law, the Secretary of State had taken it upon herself to engage in consultation, and so having done so was bound to go about it lawfully. Um, so just be aware, um, of the circumstances in which you voluntarily engage in consultation or say that you will do so. So, in overview, the circumstances in which a duty to consult will arise at law are fourfold, and where the source of the duty is not statute, the courts will be slow to impose a duty at common law. But critically, if a duty does arise, what does it require of the public authority? 
and what will it have to do to consult lawfully? And for the answer to that important question, I'll hand you over to Joe. Thanks, Dean. Um, and the headline answer is, it depends. Beloved answer of lawyers, um, there's no straight answer, but happily there are some, some guidelines which apply across the board. But the, the headline is that what you require to do, what you are required to do in order to carry out a lawful consultation will almost always depend on the circumstances of what you're consulting about, almost always. So we're sort of grasping for some frameworks, some guidelines, and happily, we've got a bit of a, of a hand from um, Stephen Sedley, Queen's Counsel, who went on to become Court of Appeal Judge, Lord Justice Sedley, in a case called Gunning. And these are called either, confusingly, the Sedley principles or criteria or the Gunning principles or criteria. It's completely interchangeable. You can choose whichever one you like best. Um, they are, as you see on the screen, um, and I'm going to look at each one of these in a little bit more detail uh, in turn. Um, first of all, that you've got to be consulting before, as um, Judith Ratcliffe puts it in her question, which I'm going to come to, before things are a fait accompli, before it's decided. It doesn't. It mustn't be a window dressing exercise. It's got to be real. Secondly, the consultation exercise has got to give those who are consulted enough information to be able to deal with it properly. Thirdly, they've got to have enough time. And fourthly, once they've responded, you've got to take them into account. Now, you can see all of these. There's a bit of overlap between all of these. And the idea is... This has to be a real process of, of real value and not a window dressing exercise. Plus, and as Dean has already said, sometimes there will be particular requirements as to consultation. And those particular requirements in statute might include you must consult these particular people or you must give this amount of time. So, for example, um, certain statutes give a, a particular time frame for consultation for a particular kind of consultation. So that's um, that's essentially the, the the overview. So I'm going to look at each one of them relatively briefly in, in turn. They're, they're relatively self-explanatory, but it's worth just having a bit more of a deep dive. So, Dean, if you could just advance the slide. There we go. And we get this morphing dog. So the first principle, as you remember, is that consultation has to happen at a formative stage. So at a stage prior to a final decision being made, what you can't do is come to a decision and then send it out for consultation with no real... Uh, intention to change your decision, essentially a closed mind, in order to kind of tick the box, yes, we consulted. It's got to be done at a time or at a stage where the ultimate outcome of what you're consulting about could still be different depending on the consultation responses. Um, shouldn't be a difficult test to get over. Uh, you don't even have to do it at a particularly early stage. Nickel and Gateshead established quite some time ago now that it's perfectly lawful to consult on a preferred option so you can already have done quite a lot of work. And, and any of you who practice like I do in planning will know that when a local plan goes out for consultation, even under Regulation 18, which is the first formal stage of consultation, a great deal of work will have been done in working up a plan. But it's still at a point where it could be changed by the consultation responses. So no problem at all with getting to a point where you've got a preferred option. And in a case I'm going to talk about in a little while, CDE. Um, that was essentially where we got to in, in that case. So that's formative stage. Next one is sufficient information uh, given. Um, again, th this is one of those ones that is a guideline and is a, is a it depends kind of guideline. And, and you've got to look at the circumstances of the case. But the information that's given with the invitation to give views has to be sufficient to allow a proper response, basically for the consultees to engage with the question at hand, to understand what's being asked and to be able to respond in a, in a meaningful way. So the information given has to relate to the decision at hand. What, what is it that's being proposed? Um, it needs to be given in a way that is available. So usually that these days that means online, um, accessible. So you, you need, if you're running a consultation, you need to think about um, those people who perhaps have difficulty getting online, um, alternative ways of accessing the information, and interpretable. So quite often, again, completely depends on the context, but quite often there'll be technical data involved, and that needs to be presented in a way that can be understood by non-experts, or at least by the people that you're asking to respond to that information. So um, there needs to be some thought about how you present data or information lying behind the decision that's being 
proposed. And the purpose of this principle and of the work that you do to meet this principle is to enable an informed response, because that's, after all, what we're trying to achieve here is to get high quality responses to whatever's being proposed in order that they can be, and this is what we're coming to, be taken into account properly and potentially shape the outcome of the decision. And, and this principle can often include, not necessarily a requirement, but certainly it might be sensible in the right context to include alternatives. So again, in the planning context, when the local plan goes for consultation, quite often there are, particularly at Regulation 18, the first formal consultation stage, there are a number of strategies for meeting future needs arising. Obvious example, um, either you put lots of houses on the edges of the big town, or you dot them around the villages in the countryside. And those might be two spatial strategies that are consulted upon in a, in a Regulation 18 consultation. So um, e even though you might have a preferred option, remember I mentioned that in the first uh, principle, it might also be worth including in the consultation some of the less preferred or reject, you know, we wouldn't call them rejected options, but uh, less preferred options uh, in order to allow some kind of comparison and for comment on on those things. So sufficient information about what exactly is being proposed. Next slide, please, Dean, which is about time. We'll leave more fair with his daily blurb. Um, and that's, a, that's some kind of anime um, gif. Uh, so adequate time given. Again, this is about fairness and about meaningfulness of the consultation. The time scale that you choose, where it isn't set by statute, if it's set by statute, you've just got to stick with that, obviously. But where it isn't set by statute, you're going to have to choose a time scale, and that time scale must give a proper opportunity to respond. Um, now, that will just depend on the complexity of the question, on the number of questions. You know, there's a there's a government consultation out at the moment on changes to the national planning policy framework, which is has many many questions, and obviously that requires a much longer time frame for response than consultation on a, on a single issue um, question. So again, you want to think about the circumstances and a time frame will have to be bespoke to the question being asked. And in certain cases, it will be worth thinking about the, the time of the year that you're doing it. You know, avoiding August is a particularly bad time. People tend to be away. Festive over Christmas tends to lose you some time. So if it's a if it would ordinarily be a 14 day consultation period and in those 14 days happens to fall either the Christmas or the Easter period, then consider adding some time because people tend not to be around and what you don't want is a complaint from somebody that they weren't they didn't have adequate time and this principle was um offended because of christmas easter august whatever so again um err on the side of caution would would be my advice in terms of adequacy of time there isn't much to be gained from rushing it through the risk of a challenge under this head much higher if you if you rush it through uh, and often you can add a week or add a few days um, without without compromising your your plan and then um the fourth one is is um perhaps the one that is the source of well certainly the source of the challenge that i recently had to deal with which i'm going to talk about in a moment and it, it seems to me to be uh the the principle that is most ripe for challenge which is really again this is judith's question um you, you must take into account the responses that you get from consultation in a conscientious way it has to be real um and actually what this principle is really about is showing that you've done that which isn't always easy um so it, obviously it mustn't be a tick box exercise the um you know the kind of cynic uh, in me and the cynic amongst you might think well you've been out to consultation You've got 18,000 resp responses, you file them in a file that says consultation responses and you get on and do what you're going to do anyway, but you have to show that you've looked at those responses and, and thought about them. Um, and you've got to do that by evidence because, as lawyers often say, uh, you should go about these things with a view to, six months down the line, being able to point a judge to what you did to show that you did it. Um, generally, taking administrative decisions is furthered or you do it better by thinking about that ghastly day in the courtroom in eight months time when someone's saying, well, where's the evidence that you took those into account? One really good way of doing that, again, this is from the world of planning, is to create a spreadsheet or a table of the consultation responses and then with, a, with one column just being a short response to the response. So that shows that you've engaged with it, 
and, and answered it. And often you can cut and paste those responses because lots of consultation responses will be the same. Now, that doesn't mean not conscientiously engaging. And that's a good way of sort of collating the evidence to show if you're challenged that you weren't window dressing, that you were genuinely having a good think about what was being said. So those are the four, that's the sort of framework. And as I said at the beginning of my little bit, you know, that those are pretty flexible ideas and they will have to flex in terms of the particular circumstances. But I think what we're going to do next is try and um, just zero in a bit on some examples of how those principles work um, in, in particular cases. So I think uh, Dean's going to deal with one first, um, looking at the Housing Act, and I'm going to talk about a couple of my cases where uh, or in fact, one mine, one that I just happen to know about, where um, these principles have been at play. So over to you, Dean. Thanks, Joe. Uh, yes, um, so we're now going to have a look at consultation principles in practice. Uh, and I'm going to look in particular at one, one or two examples which uh, illustrate the need to comply with the second of the Sedley criteria. Um, so under under parts two and three of the Housing Act 2004, as, as many of you online this morning will know, before designating an area as subject to additional or selective licensing, local housing authorities are required to take reasonable steps to consult persons likely to be affected by a designation. Those are the uh, specific words of sections 56 and, and 80. Now, in about 2010, in the very early days of selective licensing designations, um, Hindburn Borough Council proposed to designate areas of its district as subject to selective licensing. And to that end, it engaged in what it considered to be at the time a lawful consultation exercise with those likely to be affected by the designation. And I should say, in fairness to the council, these really were the early days of selective licensing designations, and the council didn't have the benefit of others' experience from which to learn before embarking on that exercise. So it sent letters to individual landlords and to a number of regional uh, and national landlord associations, inviting comments on its proposals. As Mr. Justice McComb, as he then was later held, however, uh, in the, the case of Pete that you see on your slide, that exercise fell far short of lawful consultation, and in particular of the second of the Sedley criteria in gunning. In a nutshell, it hadn't provided the consultees with sufficient information to enable an informed and intelligent response to the consultation exercise. Rather, what it had done is address consultees about general principles of selective licensing rather than the particular details of its proposed designation per se. So by way of illustration, the consultation document hadn't explained why particular areas uh, of, uh, de of, the, of the district had been chosen for designation, nor why the council thought that they met the statutory, cr statutory criteria for designation, in this case, um, that the area was suffering or was likely to suffer from low housing demand. And it had also omitted details about the boundaries of the designation areas, about the conditions of the licenses that the council would grant when the designation came into force, and indeed their likely cost, what would be the license fee. What the statutory duty required, um, Mr Justice McComb held, was uh, some precision in the identification of what is to be designated and its consequences so that the extent of the effect on those affected by it could be appreciated. And that, he held, really required consultees to know, uh, amongst other details, the extent of the designation, the likely license conditions, uh, the likely cost of applying for a license, how much a designation essentially was going to set them back. Um, and, and in terms that he held without, without some fleshing out of the reasons for the proposals, the nature of the proposals as regards license conditions and as to a fee structure, it seems to me that an informed response was really impossible. And this comes back to the point that Joe was making uh, in his treatment of the second of the Sedley um, criteria that in order, in order for there to be an informed and indeed intelligent response to the proposal that is being put forward by the public authority, 
the public, the consultees have to be provide, provided with sufficient information about, and if necessary, that has to, that, that may have to be a lot of information about alternatives, uh, for example, as Joe suggested, uh, in, in the case of the designation under the 2004 Act, if alternative designations are proposed, then the Council will have to provide enough detail about each alternative for consultees to be able to compare and contrast and express a preference. Um, the lesson for the Council at the time was a costly one, as the designation was unfortunately quashed and the Council had to begin again. Um, which brings us back to the point made at the start of this presentation that getting it right is, is really essential. But Hindburn wasn't the only council to fall foul of a consultation challenge before the Administrative Court. Enfields fared similarly in 2014 when the High Court directed it to undertake a fresh consultation exercise before bringing its designation into force. And among other reasons, uh, while the council uh, had consulted within its district about proposed additional and selective licensing designations. It hadn't consulted persons likely to be affected by them who lived and worked outside of the district but had business uh, within Enfield. So it hadn't, for example, consulted those in neighbouring boroughs. And so within the meaning of the statute, it hadn't consulted those likely to be affected by the designation. And that, 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 uh, that's in, uh, set out in the decision of, of Regus, which you'll find on your slide. <clears throat> and the, the decisions in Pete and Regus have, I, I would suggest, provided a salutary lesson for many local housing authorities since, and successful consultation challenges ha have since been fewer. And a case in point is the, is the Croydon Property Forum case, which you see on your slide, in which the council, having no doubt learned from the experience of Hindburn and Enfield, embarked on an exemplary consultation exercise, uh, meeting each of the Sedley criteria and indeed then some, and surviving a consultation challenge before the Administrative Court admirably. Uh, I would strongly recommend the reading of that decision to anyone looking to embark on a consultation under the 2004 Act, or indeed generally, um, both for its exposition of relevant principles that Joe and I have summarised today, and an example of them put ably into practice. But local housing authorities shouldn't, I would humbly suggest, lose heart, uh, because in the meantime, local, uh, uh, local housing authorities have the benefit of, of these particular decisions on your screen. So the 2004 Act duty, it was observed in the Croydon case, is a duty to take reasonable steps to consult those likely to be affected by a designation, and I stress the word reasonable steps, it was held at paragraph 45 of the Croydon Property Forum case, that it does not require every step to be taken, nor indeed all steps, nor indeed but all reasonable steps. So there is a, a limit to the duty that is imposed. And as Rotherham Metropolitan Borough Council found in 2015, the courts do tend to be slow to impugn a consultation exercise, for all of the reasons that we've summarized at the start of this webinar. So in short, as the slide suggests, don't lose heart. So enough about licensing under the 2004 Act. Let me hand back to Joe and he's gonna cover some uh, consultation uh, principles in practice under planning. Well, actually they're both licensing cases, funnily enough, although I, I practice in, in both, um, but no, no reason why you would why you would know that particularly. Um, so the, the first one is, is a, an example of what Dean spoke about at the beginning. When, when does a requirement to consult arise and how does that interact? And there was a footnote on one of Dean's slides which said um, that, that a legitimate expectation can arise where you've made a pinky promise. You remember he had a picture of a pinky promise being made. Um, but the only caveat to that is a legitimate, legitimate expectation can't arise that a local authority or a decision maker will go against a statutory duty or go beyond a statutory duty. And, and Albert Court is a good example of that. So just on the facts briefly, lots of you won't be licensing lawyers. So just a bit of background. The, the Licensing Act 2003 says that where you make an application for a new license or a variation, uh, there's a consultation period and there are very specific requirements about that. And if anyone responds and makes what's called a relevant representation within that period of consultation, 
then there has to be a hearing to consider those representations and then a decision made about what to do. But if nobody makes a representation in that period, then the application must be granted. So there's a presumption of grant, which is only displaced by the receipt of relevant representations from the consultation period. So that's the, the context. Now, in this case, the, the Albert Hall or the, or the company that runs the Albert Hall here in London made an application to add some additional license activities to its license, boxing and wrestling, if you're interested. Um, and the local authority consulted as it had to under the Act. There is a specific list of people that it must consult, or not, they're not actually people, but uh, bodies that it had to consult. It put the requisite notices up on the building and it published a notice in, or the, the applicant published a notice in a locally circulating newspaper. So satisfying the statutory criteria for the consultation. But the local authority went further than that and, and pursuant to their own policy, which they had sort of dreamed up, they also consulted, they sent letters out to anybody living in what they called the vicinity. And at that time, they defined the vicinity by way of a bird's, what is it, as the crow flies radius. So they just drew a radius of, I think, 100 metres around the Albert Hall and then said that they would consult everybody specifically, not just by newspaper and um, notice on the building. But something went wrong with their system and Albert Court, which was a block of residential flats within the, in fact, only 30 metres away from uh, the Albert Hall itself, for some reason didn't get flagged on its IT system as, as being consultable under this sort of extra policy of consultation. So they consulted everybody in the radius except for the residents of Albert Court. The consultation period came and went and no one made a representation. Um, none of the responsible authorities were interested and none of the residents who'd been sent these letters uh, had anything to say about it. The consultation period then ended and the local authority granted the licence as the statute said they had to. If no relevant representations are received in time, you must grant presumption activated. Residents of Albert Court got wind of this and said, what the hell's gone on here? We should have been consulted. You've given us a legitimate expectation that we would be consulted. We're within this vicinity idea. Um, you should have consulted us. And they challenged the decision. And they were successful at first instance. They persuaded the judge at the High Court that um, they had been given a legitimate expectation by this policy of extra consultation beyond what the statute required that that had failed, they hadn't done that, they'd thwarted their legitimate expectation, and therefore the decision uh, to grant the licence variation to the Albert Hall should be quashed. But the people who run the Albert Hall appealed to the Court of Appeal, and they won in the Court of Appeal. Now, it's quite an interesting decision, actually, the Court of Appeal decision, because without making a finding about whether there was a legitimate expectation and whether it had been thwarted and the and, and so on, the judge assumes that all those things are true, or rather the judge is, the three of them, and then asks what flows from that. So the case is basically decided on, on the essentially agreed basis that there had been a legitimate expectation that the residents of Albert Court would be consulted by a letter through their door. They hadn't been, and that was a breach of their legitimate expectation. And the reason for breaching that expectation was irrational. You know, there was no good reason for doing so. It wasn't as if they thought about it and thought, well, we won't just we just won't ask them this time. It was a computer glitch, effectively. So no justification. But, and here's the rub, thinking about remedy, of course, the Albert Hall had got the benefit of a grant of its license as a result of no representations having been received in the timescale. And so the statute said they must grant their, their license variation. And the Court of Appeal said that the legitimate expectation that had arisen for the Albert Court residents to be consulted couldn't displace or go beyond that statutory requirement to grant the license variation to the Albert Hall. Um, so in effect, the residents of Albert Court lost in the Court of Appeal. They were successful in saying that they'd been treated un unfairly, but the remedy was, sorry, lads, we can't override the statutory outcome here which is grant of a license and the judge says that um, the only remedy they weren't without a remedy if, if the problems that they were concerned about noise and so on from the boxing and wrestling came true they could bring a review so there was a sort of ex post facto way of dealing with it and also uh, the judge said that if they had got wind 
at, before the decision had been made, so before the end of the consultation period, that they'd been left out, and they might have gotten some kind of remedy to pause proceedings in order to allow them to get in. But once the decision had been made, then there was no warrant for quashing it, pursuant to this idea of a legitimate expectation. So that's, if you like, a practical example of what Dean was saying earlier about legitimate expectations arising from a policy that says, we promise to do this thing, even though we're not required to. But in that particular case, it couldn't override the statutory outcome set out in the particular piece of legislation that governs the decisions. So that's Albert Court. Um, the next example is a much more recent one, also in the field of licensing, but this time sex licensing, um, another of my little niches. This was a case that I lost. Headline um, is, is, yeah, I'm a loser. Um, it was a decision um, by Bournemouth Christchurch and Poole Council to adopt a policy uh, governing the um, regulation of sex establishments, lap dancing clubs in, in Bournemouth or in their area, but they're all in, in Bournemouth, there were none in Christchurch or Poole. Um, the reason it's called CDE is that there was an anonymity order um, about the claimant, so that's why it's all acronyms, CDEVBCP about SEVs, very helpful. Um, and in, in that case, um, they uh, BCP Council formulated a, a new policy to deal with the regulation of lap dancing clubs in, in their area. Uh, and they consulted on it really widely. They ran two really extensive consultation exercises where they asked a bunch of questions of all of their residents and a load of specific groups in the in their area, collated the responses, com complied with all of the, certainly the first three of the Gunning Sedley principles, uh, at, you know, tabulated it all, produced a, um, a sort of spreadsheet dealing with them all. They set up a working group. Um, this whole process lasted a, more than a year. Um, but uh, when it came to it, there's a particular little glitch in sex licensing, which again is vital context to understanding this case, which is that in 2001, there was a case called the Christian Institute, uh, which in fact was about sex shops, but it applies equally to sex entertainment venues, lap dancing clubs, which says that moral objections to these venues are not relevant to the licensing function so it's not relevant to say it's against you know the law of god for women to dance nude on the table um, that's not a relevant um observation about whether and where to license um these these venues the basic proposition is that they they are essentially lawful and the question is where where do we have them and what factors should determine where and and how they should be licensed not a not a kind of moral question of should they exist or should they not exist now the problem in this case is that lots of people um had something to say about the policy and lots of the people said things like lap dancing clubs are harmful to women and harmful to equality and set back equality between the sexes. Now, those of you who deal with the PSED, the Public Sector Equality Duty, will start hearing phrases, hang on a minute, these are important points. And of course, they are important points. But the problem that BCP Council had is that on the one hand, they had the Christian Institute case saying moral objections to lap dancing clubs in general, not relevant. On the other hand, they were aware of the PSED and the requirement to think about furthering equality between the sexes and not doing things which set back uh, those interests. I'm obviously paraphrasing the PSED here. And what they did was, in the course of their consideration of the consultation responses, there were a number of ways in which they tried to grapple with that issue. Anyway, to cut a long story short, uh, they adopted the policy in the end, which was a policy that, that um, did not set an upper limit on the number of SEVs in the area. You, you can set a, a cap or a limit and that limit can be zero, but this policy didn't do that. It said, we'll deal with them on a case-by-case -case basis according to locational criteria. Um, and, and that was challenged by judicial review, the decision to adopt that policy. And one of the grounds, there was a PSED ground, which I'm not going to talk about today, but what, ground one was um, a breach of the uh, rules about consultation, and in particular, principle four, the conscientious consideration point.
And that what was being said was, in a nutshell, look, you asked us all these questions and, and we said all these things about sex equality and sex equality concerns. And you said they're not relevant because they're moral considerations. So you didn't conscientiously engage with what we were saying. And in a rather difficult day in the High Court, my colleague Richie Perek and I, although I got the brunt of it because I was on my feet, um, were given a bit of a working over by um, Mr Justice Chowdhury, right, rightly, um, on all the documents. And the point about this case that I want to just bring home to you, the headline is, as I said, we lost. Amongst other things, the judge found that Bournemouth had not engaged conscientiously with the um, responses that were concerned with sex equality issues. Um, because the council had wrongly described them as being moral considerations. And again, I'm paraphrasing pretty heavily here. But the point here is that the case proceeded on a very detailed examination of the papers, the documents. So minutes of meetings, minutes of the working group, uh, training sessions given to councillors about the PSED and about moral considerations in licensing, summaries of responses. So there was a sort of report drawn up after each consult, each of the two consultation exercises, which summarized the responses, grouped them into kind of themes and topics, and then on occasion commented on them. Um, and ultimately we lost because we couldn't show, there wasn't any, well, there wasn't any sufficient evidence to show that we had drawn the line between moral considerations and legitimate sex quality based considerations, one being irrelevant, the other being highly relevant in the right place. And so it was all about the evidence, really. Um, I know that my, my our client, Bournemouth, feel ag aggrieved about that because they feel they really did conscientiously engage with the responses. And so the point about this, and I'm, this is not sound great, but the point about this is what we didn't do was tabulate and show in a, in a way that was sufficient for the court on a judicial review uh, that we had engaged in that conscientious way with the responses and, and allowed them to feed into our shaping of the, of the ultimate question, which is should we or should we not adopt this policy? Now, of course, one of the things with public law, and you, you're all either public lawyers or have an interest in public law, is that one of the kind of baffling things to non-lawyers about public law is that you can bring a challenge, a very expensive challenge, have a year's worth of fighting in the courts. Decision can be quashed. And in theory, you could go back and make exactly the same decision, just in a slightly different way. And, you know, far from it for me to tell you what I've advised BCP, but it seems to me that this was a case in point of um, the way they got to the outcome being the problem rather than the outcome itself. There was no real challenge in this case and couldn't have been to the decision in principle to have a policy which didn't uh, didn't cap the number of SEVs. That's a perfectly legitimate thing to do, but it was about how they got there. So on the one hand, a classic public law case of um, process, not outcome, but obviously the outcome, one that was not welcomed by the particular claimant, uh, but also a, a good example of um, principle four in play and the requirement to show, not just do, but show that you've conscientiously engaged with the uh, points that are being raised and not ruled them out on a basis that you can't later justify. So that's CDE and back to Dean to talk about chalk and cheese, I think. I'll do what I can on the chalk and cheese front. Uh, <clears throat> on uh, Let's um, let's move on to um, finally to to principles of reconsultation, uh, which I'll cover briefly before we we finish today. And um, the question that arises, not infrequently, certainly in in my experience, is where a public authority has has already consulted, um, and either there's been a change of circumstance since the consultation, or there's been a, a protracted period of time since the consultation finished. In what circumstances then must the public authority uh, engage in a reconsultation before it can make the decision that it in the first place proposed to make? Um, and the short answer to that, uh, provided by the, the case of uh, Smith and East Kent Hospital NHS Trust, is that a duty to, to reconsult will generally only arise if there is a fundamental difference between the proposals about which the authority consulted in the first place and those that it later wishes to adopt. Uh, and I would stress 
the word fundamental in that in that decision. Um, it was put in a different way in in the Gunning case, to which we've already referred by by Mr. Justice Hodgson, who who, who suggested that a reconsultation would really only be necessary if the new proposal was entirely different uh, from that which had been first proposed by the authority. So before a, a duty to reconsult will arise, there really is quite a high threshold that has to be crossed, uh, it, either in terms of change of circumstance uh, or changes to the to the fundamentals of, of the proposal being put forward by the, by the local authority. So the nature and the extent of that difference really is of crucial importance. And generally speaking, uh, although the word modifications was uh, being construed in the context of a particular statute in Smith, um, mere modifications to a proposal about which there has been a consultation will not trigger a duty to reconsult. L let me try to illustrate that point for you uh, with some quite extreme examples. And obviously, there will be a, a, a considerable grey area between uh, these ends of the, of the colour spectrum. So in the case of, let, let's, let's go back to, to licensing under the 2004 Act. Let's say a local housing authority goes out to consultation about a proposal to designate uh, half of its district as subject to selective licensing. Now, uh, it, it, if it later uh, rather than that particular half of its district proposed to designate the other half instead, having looked at the consultation results, then the, the likelihood is it's going to have to reconsult because the proposal would be fundamentally different. In fact, it would be entirely different from the proposal about which it had first consulted. At the other end of the spectrum, though, if in fact, having looked at the consultation responses, the local authority thinks, well, actually, nothing wrong with our proposed area of designation. What, what we're going to do is we're going to tweak the, the license fees and we may change some of the license conditions. Well, that really is, to my mind, I would suggest a mere modification of the original proposals. And ordinarily is not something that is going to be considered fundamentally different so as to trigger the duty to reconsult. So if you're faced with circumstances in which it's being suggested that you need to reconsult, take a look at the Smith case in particular. It's, uh, it's been upheld and applied subsequently. So uh, it, it remains, is and remains good law, despite being a decision that is now uh, over 20 years old. And for the reasons that we touched upon at the very start of this webinar, the courts will again be generally very slow to impose a duty of reconsultation. And I've included on this slide for you uh, an extract from uh, Mr. Justice Silver's uh, judgment in Smith. Uh, and given that we have some time, I'll, I'll read that out for you. So it's necessary to bear in mind not only the strong obligation of the defendants to consult, but also the dangers and consequences, hence the warning sign in the picture, uh, of too readily requiring reconsultation, as those dangers also flow from the underlying concept of fairness. Pause there for a moment. Requiring an authority to engage in reconsultation brings with it the concomitant cost and time um, that will be spent by the authority in engaging in that exercise, and, and that is costly in both, both respects. Uh, so so uh, the judge continued, the concept of fairness should determine whether there's a need to reconsult if the decision maker wishes to accept a fresh proposal, but the court should not be too liberal in the use of its power of judicial review to compel further consultation of any change on any change. A proper balance has to be struck, and this is where the fundamental difference uh, dicta uh, come in. There should only be reconsultation if there is a fundamental difference between the proposals consulted on and those which the consulting party subsequently wishes to adopt. Now, that the Smith case um, concerned a change in circumstances um, since the original consultation. But what happens if, in fact, there has been a protracted period of time uh, between the original consultation and uh, bringing the decision or the proposal or the, or the policy that the, the authority wants to bring into effect into play. 
Well, again, and for the reasons we've already covered, the courts will generally be slow to impose a duty to reconsult, despite what might be considered to be a fairly protracted period of time. And uh, the Peak case that we looked at previously um, covered this issue in particular. And in the Peak case, if memory serves me correctly, there had been something like a 19 month delay between the end of the consultation period and the council bringing its selective licensing designation into force. And what was said in the administrative court was that as, as a result of that passage of time, the fruits of that consultation exercise, the results, the feedback that the council had got had become stale. Um, and indeed the consultate, the proposal made by the authority had, had changed in some respects since the end of that consultation. And so it was said there was a duty to reconsult. Now, I would stress, uh, as many lawyers will, that each case obviously turns on its own facts um, and indeed on the thoroughness of the original consultation. But even in those circumstances, I say where there's been a passage of time, the courts won't readily require reconsultation simply because of the passage of time. And what happened in, in Pete is, in fact, the, uh, as we saw, the, the designation was quashed for other reasons. Uh, but the judge went on to say that uh, if the consultation had otherwise been adequate, I would have been inclined to hold that the period between consultation and designation was not so long as to vitiate the exercise. However, if the council's consultation is a shallow one, as in my view this one was, its usefulness is likely to have a much shorter sell-by date. So the lesson really to take from Pete in this context is that the results of a consultation, the fruits of a consultation exercise will have a shelf life. But provided you comply conspicuously and thoroughly with the principles that Joe has elucidated earlier in this webinar, then that shelf life can be quite protracted. And even, for example, as in the case of Pete, a period of 19 months might not be such as to trigger a duty to reconsult. So what do we take from that? Comply with the principles, make sure you consult lawfully. The consequences otherwise could be costly. I'm conscious uh, that uh, time is passing us by. And so what I'm gonna do is re refer you very briefly to a slide on recent consultation decisions that Joe and I have included really for your information more than anything else. We don't possibly have the time to go through them in any detail, but if you want to see examples of the principles that Joe and I have discussed in play, take a read of some of these cases. These are some of the more significant cases from the last um, two to three years, uh, and they will illustrate amply the points that, that Joe and I have covered. And so with the time being now gone five to 11, um, Joe and I will bring the webinar to a close, subject to any questions that there might be. And I can see there might be one, in fact, there is, Dean. Yeah, you spotted it. And it's from Deborah Down. Hello, Deborah. Thank, thanks for asking. I think it's one we can deal with relatively swiftly. The, the question is um, that we've both referred to there being questions in a consultation exercise or, do or document. Um, is this an absolute requirement? Or are there circumstances where you could just set out the facts and options and then ask, what do you think? And the, the answer is, uh, no, it's not an absolute requirement at all. This is one of those examples of consultation exercises being um, you know, almost infinite in their variation. Sometimes it will be on a on a plan, and the question will be, "Here's the plan. What do you think?" And a, a regulation eighteen or nineteen consultation doesn't have set questions usually. It just has the plan, and you're then invited to give your views. Um, on the other hand, the, the sort of recent style of governmental com, um, consultation exercises have very specific questions. You know, they set out a proposition and then say what do you think about this? Or you know, do you agree that we should do this or, or whatever? Um, so no, there's no requirement there be questions. Uh, it will completely depend on the um, nature of the decision being thought about. I don't know if you want to add anything, Dean. And I see another question just popped into, which I can hand to you if you like. Yeah, I, I, I entirely, entirely right, Joe. I would only add to, to that answer that um, obviously you as an authority will want to be um, uh, obtaining from the consultation 
uh, sufficient information to be able to, to feed your analysis of your proposal and make a decision. So you, you, you might need to structure the questions quite carefully to make sure that you get the information you want, at, while at the same time giving consultees the freedom to be able to express a view. Um, so so Joe's entirely right. There's an infinite number of ways in which you can frame a consultation exercise. Uh, you might simply want to frame it so that you make sure you get the information you want. Um, so uh, the next question, Alison, uh, when would a protracted period come into play regardless of whether the principles are being complied with and how long would that period likely need to be to be a relevant factor for the court to consider? Well, that's an incredibly difficult question um, to answer, and, and I'm going to I'm going to refer you back to my lawyer's answer previously. That each case will turn on its facts, and to a large degree on the on the thoroughness of the consultation exercise, and indeed the nature of the proposal about which the authority is consulting. Each case is necessarily going to turn on its facts, um, but, but I would suggest that <clears throat> get, given that inevitably. The results of any consultation will have a shelf life. You don't want to be hanging around um, unnecessarily after the consultation is finished because of the danger of challenge. Um, so in short, don't waste any time. Be proactive. Make sure you consider, as Joe has rightly suggested um, and indicated, make sure you consider the results of the consultation um uh, conscientiously and and demonstrate that you've done so but when you've done that there's no reason in principle why you shouldn't then go ahead and make a decision and just to add to that i think it's probably right to say that if you can explain why you either have or haven't gone back out for consultation in a rational way then that will also bolster you against challenge so you know all the points that dean's making you you want to be evidencing these really by way of a report or a kind of um yeah a, sh a short note really of, of the idea that you've thought about whether the results have become stale whether the period is sufficiently long to be a problem and decided either that it is or that it isn't and as long as that's rational then I think generally I mean generally you'll have a pretty good defense to a challenge on on that front yeah um, the, the last question is a is a procedural one rather than a substantive one which is will the slides be circulated i don't know if we're going to circulate the slides but the webinar itself is available or will be available on the chamber's website under the events tab so you can re-watch re it or you can just fast forward to the particular slides and turn the sound down if that's your thing so um thanks louise for that question a reminder to remind you all that if you'd like to re-watch it or um look at the slides again then they will be available on the chamber's website I think that brings us unbelievably to uh, one minute before 11, which gives us something less than a minute to say thanks very much for coming. Um, thanks very much for coming all week, actually. It's been a really exciting thing for our public law team to do. It's the first uh, public law week event that we've done in Chambers. Um, and so we're extremely grateful to you all for attending uh, and for your questions. Um, and it now ticks over to 11, so I'll say thanks very much from Dean and from me and from all of Cornerstone for coming along. Hope you have a lovely weekend. Thanks very much.